Hi, um, Alita, thank you for inviting me, and thank you, Christina, for the introduction. Um, this is going to be slightly different from the last two speakers, although Thomas did uh, mention um, issues of integration and direct or indirect discrimination and how these uh, different groups uh, can live in a symbiotic way. So I'm going to talk about um, two things. Uh, one is my research uh, with uh, my co-author, Lucinda Platt, on the type of contact and its relationship with ethnic identity and its implication for the current situation. And then also very briefly talk a little bit about a large UK household panel study that I am using in this research, which is um, quite useful for ethnicity and um, migration research. So this is the research that I'm going to talk about. Now, <clears throat> the way it relates to today's um, session and the conference is that we have seen recent increase in the number of migrants, which means there will going to be a lot of different people from different groups who are going to be brought in very close contact with each other very quickly. And there will be issues of how um, these groups will deal with each other. And there is always potential of intergroup conflict. Now, what do we know about these issues until now? Now, this is nothing new. It may be new in some countries, but multicultural and diverse societies have been dealing with this issue for a long time. Um, there are many countries which have a very long history of migration of different groups um, living together. The US, some of the South American countries like Brazil, India, many African countries have um, uh, faced this issue. But I will specifically talk about the UK today. Now, in the UK, most of the um, public, political, and academic debate and research has actually focused on the immigration since the 1950s, which brought with it new ethnic groups, which UK was not familiar with at that time. But in fact, prior to the 1950s, there is a long history of regional differences in the UK where there are strong regional identities and intergroup conflict. So if you're not familiar with this issue, this is the map of UK. UK is actually comprised of four separate countries. England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. You can see the population distribution. And our current research has shown that there are even now, so it's not something that happened 50 years ago, even now there are very strong regional identities, so country identities, Scottish, English, Welsh, Northern Irish identities. And quite often it is weaker than uh, what is now considered to be a national identity, the Britishness or British identity. So I just wanted to put this in perspective. Now going back to what is uh, typically referred to as ethnic groups or ethnic minority groups in the UK. These, these, as I said, are the groups that arrived since the 1950s, mostly from Commonwealth countries. So the five major ethnic minority groups that are often talked about are Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, Black Caribbean, and African groups. And then recently since uh, 2001, uh, white minority groups. Now in the 1960s and 70s, uh, there was a lot of focus on discrimination and disadvantage that these ethnic minorities group faced in housing, in employment, um, and various other sec uh, sectors. And soon after that, the Race Relations Act uh, was implemented, and then it has been upgraded, I mean, revised since then quite a few times. But what that meant is uh, you would need to, to understand whether this discrimination and disadvantage was being address these issues, you would have to somehow monitor. And that is why the uh, question rose that how would we monitor them? And so in 1991, for the first time, the UK census introduced questions on ethnic groups. Now this is slightly different from the way uh, the, the language is um, in uh, the, the last two speakers. It is not an issue of immigrants and natives because by now, a lot of immigrants have children who have grown up their second generation. So they don't consider themselves immigrants for obvious reasons. So the language is more in terms of ethnic groups. 
So this is just a quick look at the 2011 UK census. And uh, as you can see, this is a, sorry, 2011 UK census ethnic group question. And th these are the categories. Now the first category, which says white, English, Welsh, Scottish, Northern Irish, and British, that is, most people would take that, and that is the, what is, we refer to as either white British or white majority group. So they are the majority group there. And now, uh, this is how the proportion of ethnic minorities in the UK has increased over the last three censuses. So in 1991, about 7% were non-white ethnic minorities. Um, you couldn't identify um, white minorities. In 2001, the proportion rose to 9%, and if you include um, et white ethnic minorities, it's 12%. And now the total number of ethnic minorities is about 18 to 19%. So it's about one fifth of UK's population. Now, just the way there is a long history of diverse ethnic groups living together and conflict, there is a long history in uh, disciplines like sociology, anthropology, social psychology of trying to understand these. So why are certain groups formed and some groups continue while others disappear? Why is there discrimination and prejudice against outgroup members and in favor of in-group members? What it is that driving uh, these attitudes? Then there are quite often very strong prescriptions on individual behavior by the groups. So you belong to a group and there are certain ways you behave, certain things you don't do, you don't interact with other group members and so on. So these have been studied for over uh, 50, 60 years, actually longer in some disciplines. Now, the one that I'm going to focus on, which is um, the focus of the research, is um, Henri Tachfel uh, is a, was a social psychologist. And he postulated that to understand discrimination and prejudice, what you need to find out is two things. One, are people able to identify groups? And second, do they identify themselves with these groups? So both things are needed, not just the existence of different groups, but whether you identify with these groups. And that is called social identity. Then of course, the question is what are groups? And these are three academics from different disciplines, and they've all come to the same conclusion. There is no objective basis for groups in most cases. So you can't say this is what it is. In a multicultural, multi-ethnic society, all the group members know who belongs to which group. The lines are known and everybody's aware of it. But if you were to come from a different society and try to find out, it would take you a while to figure out why is it that these groups exist. Sometimes it's language, sometimes regional differences, sometimes religion, but there is no objective basis for it. And sometimes it's difficult for outsiders to even understand why are these groups so different or they consider themselves to be different. So we will take groups as given. So what Tajfel said is social identity will be understood as that part of an individual self-concept which derives from his knowledge of his membership of a social group or groups together with the value and emotional significance attached to that membership. And this is quite key. Um, the, um, there was a series of experiments that were done by Tajfel and his predecessor and some of his newer colleagues. These are now referred to as the minimal experiments. They are really interesting experiments. What they did was they basically asked people that you can give money to someone. It's a hypothetical question. And this person belongs to your group. And then another hypothetical question, this person belongs to a different group. Now, as you would expect, people tended to give more money to their in-group members, less to out-group members. Now, that is fine. That was expected. But then what they did is they tinkered with the definition of groups instead of pre-existing groups, they then assigned people to groups based on, say, their favorite painter, Picasso and Klandinsky, or something like that was one of the experiments. It still persisted. Then what they did was they, did, they even took away any kind of link to you and your group. So they literally flipped a coin in front of the respondents and said, you're going to be assigned to this group and you to that group. So there was no basis for these groups. But just the fact that they belonged to these groups they still 
exhibited the same kind of behavior. It was weaker because these groups made less sense, but still it existed. So the idea is this identification with group is very important. You extend your own identity and you in, attach it to the group, and then this behavior becomes sort of almost obvious. And this is how, but we do need to distinguish between the social identity with personal identity. People are different and people do differentiate between themselves and everybody else. And so when you think of personal identity, you talk in terms of I versus them. In terms of social identity, you talk us versus them. So immediately you can see the difference. In social identity, you don't care about individual differences or characteristics. So individuals matter less. Suddenly they become representatives of groups and you only see groups. In personal identity, there are many differences and you just uh, discuss the individual characteristics. So what Hachfar and others then conceptualized was this what is called a continuum of identity or even intergroup differences, where at the one extent, end are social contexts where your intergroup differences are highlighted. So this is when media is constantly talking about this, this group and that group and they did this and that many immigrants have arrived and doing this. Uh, so there you are constantly badgered with this information that these are other group members and that's where your social identity gets heightened. At the other extreme are uh, situations where your intra-group differences or interpersonal differences are highlighted. So suppose, um, as the two previous speakers have already mentioned, in uh, inter-ethnic marriages. So your partner is of a different ethnic group. In those situations, you are less likely to think of them as a group member and more as your partner. So it's the individual differences that matter. And, and these situations are fluid. So you can move in and out of these situations and your identities vary accordingly. Now, contact theory also came to a very similar conclusion. Alport in 1954 said that if you are in situations where there is equal group status, within that situation there are common goals, intergroup cooperation and authority support that will lead to reduction of prejudice and there is some empirical basis for that. So the hypothesis or the framework is this that if you have contact with other ethnic group members that reduces the intergroup differences, then it leads to reduction of prejudice. And what social scientists did is that they said there is a link in between. The way it, this prejudice decreases is by weakening of your social identity. And that is what we are going to um, measure today. There is very little empirical research using large-scale data. There are experimental evidence and small-scale surveys which have found uh, similar findings. And so what we will do is we're going to use a very large UK national survey and try to see whether these hypotheses hold. So we are going to consider two types of contact. One, which is we call just type one contact, which reduces intergroup differences and then see if it reduces social identity. And the other is type two contact. And then we will see whether these relationships differ for ethnic minorities and majority groups in the UK. Sorry. Um, so the data that we're going to use is from Understanding Society. It's a household panel survey that started in 2009 with around 30,000 households. And what we then did was we matched information for every individual adult respondents in our survey with the region that they were living in, the locality and we match the data to the census data of that locality to get the ethnic group composition. We are just considering 16 to 59 year olds living in England, mostly because most ethnic minorities live in England, so the comparison, and that is our sample sizes. And if you're interested, then these are the sample sizes for the different ethnic minority groups that is there in our sample, and we're going to study that. Just to uh, be clear, in all these models that we are going to estimate, we are controlling for all the usual factors by which the ethnic groups vary, age, sex, marital status, education, household income, occupation, class, health, and neighborhood deprivation. So what is the uh, first uh, hypothesis? The first hypothesis is minority ethnic group members will express stronger ethnic identity than the majority group 
because all their contact and context heightens into group differences. So they're always, they are aware that they are the ethnic minority. They're always made aware of it. And so it is going to be stronger than the majority. On the other hand, first generation, those who have arrived recently, for them it shouldn't matter less because they are still not aware of these groups. And so for them, the ethnic identity should be weaker. So what did we find? We did find ethnic minorities report stronger ethnic identity than white majority respondents. This is robust across different specifications. But surprisingly, there was no generational difference. Across first and second generation, ethnic identity was very strong, much stronger than white majority. The next hypothesis is we would expect both minority and majority members who are living in mixed ethnic relationships will express weaker ethnic identity than others. And similarly, if they have very close and best friends who are of a different ethnic group, again, they're likely to have weaker social identity. Because this is a cross-sectional analysis right now, uh, you could say that it's, it is a matter of reverse causality. You have a weaker ethnic identity, hence you make friends or partner with people of a different ethnic group. So what we will do is we will split the duration of these relationships. If it is not a case of reverse causality, then we should only see these relationships hold for long duration partnerships. So what do we find? We find for everyone, if they are living in mixed ethnic partnerships, they are more likely to report weaker ethnic identity. And this holds only for durations that are five years or longer, because that means it has changed over the years and it's not selection. For the next hypothesis about best friends ethnic group, for ethnic minorities we see it does hold up, and it holds up for relationships that are three years or longer, but not 10 years. I'm guessing it could be something to do with some small sample sizes at that end. But for interestingly, for white majority respondents, we don't find a support for this. What we do find is if they have friends of a different, these are best friends, so they're very close friends of a different ethnic group, they report a stronger ethnic identity. This was quite surprising, but what we realized is once we control for ethnic group composition in your neighborhood, this statistical significance disappeared. So it's quite possible that white majority are more likely to have close friends if they are living in the areas where there are people of different ethnic group. And so this variable was proxying for the neighborhood effect, which I'll talk about just now. So then if you look at type two, a contact where we've measured in two ways. One is uh, the proportion of own ethnic group in your neighborhood, and the other is the proportion of your casual acquaintance, not people with whom you have very close contact, what proportion of them are of a different ethnic group. And as I said, we would expect that because these are casual contacts, people you just see, but you don't really interact closely, uh, it's likely to lead to stronger ethnic identity. Um, interestingly, what we find is for ethnic minorities, they don't hold up, they don't matter. But what does matter is whether you live in London or not. And that is because London has about 45 to 50% ethnic minorities. So London is like a little different country in UK. The co entire national context changes. And so that is why we find a different result that ethnic minorities living in London have a weaker ethnic identity because it's a different context. For the white majority, we do have um, support for this hypothesis. I'll skip this. So what is the conclusion? So the main conclusion is that we have evidence of weakening effect on ethnic identity due to close contact with other group members, partners, and close best friends. And the reverse is true when it's just casual contact, you're just aware of these groups present. So in terms of policy recommendations, obviously I cannot make strong policy recommendations, but the idea is that if different ethnic groups are brought in close contact with each other in situations where they can interact on an individual basis, they will start to see each other as individuals and less as group members. And that is how one goes about reducing prejudice and discrimination. I'll skip this and I just want to spend two, three minutes on the study that I used for this uh, analysis. 
So this is a UK household longitudinal study which started in 2009. It started with around 40,000 households, all adults that is 16 years or above in these sample households and their descendants are followed and interviewed every year. Um, and so, and, but anybody moving into these households are also interviewed because they provide the household context. This has three components. One is a general population sample of 26,000 households, and that is uh, representative of the UK. It has a huge geographical spread, which allowed me to do this analysis where I had variation by location. And the large sample size also allows different minority samples, like single mothers and disabled people, to be analyzed separately. What is good and particularly of interest here is that it has an ethnic minority boost sample of around 4,000 households with at least 1,000 adult interviews from the five major ethnic minority groups. And this is the only survey in the UK which allows longitudinal research for ethnicity and migration. So if you want to study uh, employment dynamics, poverty dynamics, and so on, you could use that. This has another component which is a long-running similar household panel survey, which was then added to this, but I'll not talk about that. This is um, the, in wave one, when it was started, this is what the sample sizes looked like. And just, if you're going to do, use this for your analysis, remember that the ethnic minority boost sample and the general population sample should be used together because otherwise they don't have, Otherwise, you'll have coverage error because the ethnic minority boost sample was selected from high ethnic minority concentration areas. And then after five waves of survey, in the sixth wave, as you, we added a new ethnic minority and boost sample. The reason was partly that, as you would expect with attrition, the sample sizes for the ethnic minority groups had reduced, but also we had, did not include any immigrants who had arrived into the country since 2009. And because UK is such a constantly changing um, society, that would have been a problem. And so we added that. Um, so in combination with it, it allows you to do um, longitudinal research for ethnicity and migration. These are some of the new sample numbers that we have don't cited because we've not released the data as yet. I'm just showing you. And I'll just end um, with Again, if you're interested in doing research in UK with this, that there are a lot of interesting questions. They cover different measures of measuring ethnic groups, not just the census ethnic group question, but religion, your parents, grandparents, um, country of birth, the year you arrived, language that you spoke when you were a child, national identity, ethnic identity, and so on. And a whole bunch of behavior variables, like remittances, migration history, experience of harassment, uh, reasons for migration, and so on. And then, because it's a multi, ethnicity is one angle of the survey, so it's a multi-purpose survey. It has all the usual questions that you would anyway expect in such surveys. So I'll not go over the list again. And just to give one quick look at the reasons for migration, this is the new data that we have just collected and going to be released in November this year. So we were just looking at reasons for migration by gender. And as you can see, and as you would expect, at least in the case of UK, uh, women are more likely to arrive as family migrants to join their partners, and men are more likely to arrive as work or education and other reasons. So I'll just end. <laughs>